Thank you so much, Gwen, for the kind introduction, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here for our first ever homecoming lecture. I guess first ever homecoming as well. So, uh, so uh, as Gwen said, the title of my talk is Almost Random, and I'm going to go through a number of different topics uh, in today's talk. Uh, so let me just give a brief talk outline before we uh, jump in. So for the talk outline, we're going to start with a few questions on well, what is randomness? Uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, because that's a question for the philosophers. But as mathematicians, computer science, and statisticians, we do need to have some sense of what randomness actually is. We'll talk a little bit about probability distribution. And then we'll jump straight into a couple different ways that uh, the various disciplines at CMS harness randomness for all kinds of problem solving. So we're going to start with statistical sampling, uh, which uh, many of you will probably be familiar with. Um, and then we're going to move on to randomized algorithms. Algorithms. And then we're going to move on to the probabilistic method, uh, which I don't think was in my abstract, but I thought it was appropriate method. Um, and then we're going to finish off with a tiny bit of genomics. And the reason I picked these topics is that, well, this is the CMS department, right? So we want to have some CS in here, and so that's what the randomized algorithms are for. Uh, we want to have some math in there, and so it turns out you can actually use random numbers, randomness, to prove interesting theorems about non-random things. So we'll give an example of that, uh, and we'll, that will be the one actual proof uh, in this talk. And of course, uh, randomness and statistics uh, go hand in hand. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, oh, I almost forgot. There is a reason for the genomics as well. Uh, left because that's so well me. So. Okay. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any point. Let's go ahead and get started. So first, whenever we're talking about randomness, uh, one thing you might wonder is, well, how does that show up in our everyday lives? Well, uh, today it looks like a very nice and sunny day outside, um, and so maybe I want to go on a picnic. So let's say that I, uh, well, let's say uh, I want to go to Queen's Park downtown, uh, and I, well, let's uh, draw a tree layer. Uh, there's some grass, and uh, there's me uh, here in gold. There's me. Uh, it's a very, very small tree. Um, and if it is bright and sunny, so if it happens to be bright and sunny, so let's put this sun out there. And uh, if it's bright and sunny, then I'm probably happy because if it's sunny, then I can probably convince my friends to come out and uh, join me on a picnic in the park or playing frisbee or whatever. So I have friends, and that makes me happy. Unfortunately, you all know that it isn't always sunny here in Toronto. Sometimes it's, uh, well, the opposite of sunny. In fact, sometimes it's raining. And what happens when it's raining? Well, when it's raining, the situation might be quite different. We still have the tree here, but it's a little bit less happy because it's being blown in the wind. Uh, we have some terrible storm clouds. Uh, where is my storm cloud color? Uh, we'll use this color for it. So we have some storm clouds, uh, and it's raining. And when, when that happens, well, I'm still here because uh, I was silly and went out this flight knowing that there was a chance of rain, but it's raining, and I am not, uh, not so happy because all my friends are going to abandon me if I try to get them to come out and do a picnic in the middle of a rainstorm. Uh, so th this would be quite sad. So what happens? Uh, what happened there? What did I not think into it? Uh, oh no, I'm sad. Um, <laughs> So what happened there? The issue was there was some amount of randomness in the weather, right? So we don't know whether it's going to be sunny or um, rainy on any particular day. Uh, we might have some idea of whether it's likely to be one or another, but that's one example of how randomness can and uncertainty can make our lives, well, either fun or not so fun. Uh, to pick an, let's pick another example a little bit closer to home. So many of you are UTSC students, and if uh, you're, you compete regularly to UTSC, well, one way of getting here is by taking the bus. So maybe you want to uh, come here from Kennedy Station, which is my usual commute. And so then you'll take the bus. So this is the 905. Well, there's a back door here, another window here, and then the back window there. So this is the 905. Oh, I should probably give it wheels. Uh, those are useful for buses. OK, so the bus is coming. Uh, I am, uh, again, uh, let's say this is me. I'm standing at a bus stop, not actually in the road in front of the uh, uh, in front of the bus. Uh, but I'm at the bus stop. Uh, let's draw that in. Uh, let's say there's a little awning that sometimes is used in front of the bus stop. But anyway, so I'm standing there, and then I have a question, right? Like, when will the bus arrive? 
It could be so. It could be, arrive immediately. It could be five minutes. It could be thirty minutes. Um, it really depends. Like sometimes you go to Candy Station and there are two buses there right behind each other, and you're like, and if you miss one of them, then well, you're stuck for the next half hour. You're late to lecture, and then as a student, it's a bit sad because you missed the first uh, part of a great lecture. As a professor, it's even worse because that means all your students miss the first half of a great lecture. But so this is not great, right? Um, this randomness seems to just be a problem. Like, why, why do we have randomness in this world anyway? Like, it would be easier if everything just went smoothly, right? Um, but yeah, so, uh, uh, as we'll see in this lecture, though, there are some quite useful, uh, there are some things that are quite useful about randomness. Uh, before we move on, though, I want to make a, uh, ask you all a question about what is randomness. So, when I have a, break, uh, when I'm going out to a picnic, whether it's rainy or sunny, that seems random, right? Okay, I see a couple of nods. Yeah, <laughs> maybe random, maybe not. Uh, let me give another hypothetical. What if instead of um, I had an evil wizard? Let's name him Murphy for after Murphy's Law. Let's say he's an evil wizard up here in the clouds with an evil wizard staff and an evil wizard hat. So this is an evil wizard. Uh, so he's angry. Uh, let's say there's an evil wizard out there who, whenever I decide to go out for a picnic, makes it rain. Is that random? No, no. no that's not random at all. Uh, because that's, uh, so just because something's going wrong or something isn't what I want doesn't mean that it's not random. And so somehow randomness has this sense that it's not deterministic. Like things don't always happen uh, according to some way that we can predict. So if you believe in Murphy's Law that if something can go wrong, it will, well then you don't really believe in randomness in some sense because you're believing that things will always go wrong. Uh, and if you're optimistic, if you have rose the glass and everything and you believe that things will always go right, um, that's also not really randomness because that's all in the other direction. So really when I'm talking about this example, I'm talking about how you don't know, the sort of uncertainty in life. Uh, that is some sense of what randomness is. It's not the only sense, but it's one sense of what randomness uh, could be. Uh, any questions about that? Okay. So, moving on, let's talk a little bit about different types of randomness. Because, like, we have this vague sense that, oh, well, randomness is what happens when we don't know what's going on. But that's not really super satisfying, right? That's not a very formal definition. Uh, and I'm not going to give you a formal definition here, since this is a public lecture. But I'm just going to give a couple examples where in either real life or in mathematics or uh, that you might encounter different types of random. So some of you here might have taken some physics. And there's one source of randomness that, met, that a lot of people agree seems to be truly random under uh, different people's interpretations. And that is quantum mechanics. So I won't go into too much detail here, but uh, this is what causes, for example, if you have a nucleus of an atom. Um, if you have a big atom with a nucleus here, so it has some protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and it has some electrons that are floating around. So one of the things that can happen to uh, some big atoms is they'll break apart spontaneously. Uh, so they'll spontaneously emit radiation. And when that happens, um, you end up with two pieces, uh, two smaller pieces. And the timing of when a um, nucleus spontaneously breaks up, that is due to quantum effects and seems to be true, truly random. We don't have a good way of predicting that. And not only that, physicists think that it isn't possible to exactly predict when an atom uh, quantum effects. And there are many other examples of this, but that's one example of what uh, physicists at least think to be true randomness in the universe. A lot of the randomness that we deal with in our everyday life, though, that's not really quantum randomness. It has more to do with a mathematical concept of uh, chaos. So chaos. chaos. Um, and what is chaos? Well, chaos really just means that, well, maybe if you knew everything, maybe if you were omniscient and knew every single thing that was happening in the universe, you could predict things in the future because you know every single state. So for example, if I'm rolling, I have a die here. If I'm rolling this die, um, the number that comes up, that seems sort of random, right? But if I knew exactly how hard I throw the die down, if I knew exactly the error patterns, exactly how it bounces on the sheet of paper, well, then maybe I could predict where the die lands. And in fact, there are some people who learn to throw dice in exactly the right way to, uh, well, basically cheat at dice games. Um, and so, somehow, this isn't exactly fully random, but we still treat it as randomness because if I don't know exactly how my dice, uh, my die is going to roll, and so therefore it's unpredictable to me. And the reason it's so hard to predict is because tiny changes in how the die hits the uh, surface of the table uh, will change where it ends up. 
And so this is an example of a random list, and I'm going to give another quick example of random list that I particularly like because it's one of the ones that I teach in Math uh, C58, uh, Introduction to Mathematical Biology. And this is uh, chaos that uh, came out of an equation studying uh, population sizes. So if you have a bunch of different uh, organisms in the environment, how many organisms do you have? Uh, one thing that, one equation people use for that is the logistic uh, map, where you go, uh, it's very simple, so it's x m plus 1 is equal to x uh, r times x m times 1 minus x m, where r is equal to, uh, sorry, r is greater than 3.56995, and it's less than 4, uh, and x is between 0 and 1. So this equation is one of the classic examples of randomness, because what happens is you'll notice this equation has um, x m plus 1 and x m. So I plug in, say, x 0, and then I get out a new number, x 1. And I repeat this, and I get x 2, and then x 3, and so on. Um, and so this is completely non-random, right? Because, of course, if I give you the very first thing, then you can uh, plug your numbers into your calculator, and you can exactly predict the entire future of all the different x's. But that's only true if you can compute things exactly. It turns out um, that uh, often you can't predict things as well because of slight uh, uh, errors in approximation. Um, first I'll mention, though, this is not random if r is equal to 2. If r is equal to 2, uh, and you start at, say, x0 is equal to 0 0.5, well, then this entire equation it just always stays at 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. So that's not random, since all your points are just in a row there. If r is equal to 3, uh, and x minus is equal to 0 0.5, you get a slightly different behavior. You get um, that goes to 0 0.63, and that goes to 0 0.69, but that goes back to 0 0.63, and so on, 0 0.69. And so that repeats, and so that's also, that's very predictable. So the sort of idea is that because it's constantly going up and down and up and down, that's very predictable. Um, for larger Rs, though, I need another sheet of paper. Um, so if R is equal to 3.7 low, 0.5 goes to 0.79, which goes to 0 0.62, which goes to 0 0.87, which goes to 0 0.41, and so on. And so it constantly bounces around, and it turns out this is highly dependent on the exact decimal place, on the, all the farther decimal places. And so even if you can't in theory predict what the next thing is going to be, if you accidentally cut off um, a, a decimal place, you might end up with a completely different answer. Do we have a question? Yeah, sure. If for this function, if you saw that x could you then predict that x0 was 0 0.5? Yeah. Uh, can you go backwards? Um, so if you knew exactly what it was, um, I'm not sure, I actually don't, I think it is injective, so I think you could, uh, if you knew everything. Um, but the problem is that if you, um, I'm actually not sure, so I don't want to say that uh, for certain, but the issue is that if you're trying to do, go, go backwards, you still end up with sort of this sort of chaotic behavior. So I guess, uh, and when you say you have to know everything, for you to be able to actually go back and predict, you would have to know that it was x5. That yeah, so that was exactly x, uh, that was exactly, oh sorry, you wouldn't need to know the fifth point. But it, like, if it was like 0 0.41, you'd have to know that was exactly 0 0.41 and not 0 0.41001. Uh, because those tiny differences get magnified. And that's sort of the point of uh, chaos theory is tiny differences starting off get magnified as, you, as time goes on. Um, I, do, I don't want to say anything about injectivity because I forget that, uh, honestly, for this particular equation. Uh, this is just the logistic map uh, that's been very well studied, so if you're interested in that, you should look forward to that. Okay, any other questions? So, I've been mostly talking about examples of randomness that have some sort of either physical source, uh, so quantum mechanics, or some sort of mathematical source, uh, chaos, chaotic behavior, where either something we truly think isn't knowable, as in the case of quantum mechanics, or something is in theory knowable, but you really have to know exactly, uh, uh, little differences make a big difference, and so if you have any sort of e error, it gets magnified. There's another source of randomness, which we might think about, uh, which is, well, we often use, oh, uh, we often say it's some, that something's so random in everyday life, uh, not in sort of any sort of mathematical sense. So what is that really? And is it just a matter of us being absent-minded? So as an example, uh, I had the uh, bus earlier, right? So the bus, uh, the, the time that the bus comes seems sort of random, but if, for example, you had a GPS on the bus uh, and you were able to keep track of where the buses are on the 905 at all points, then maybe it doesn't seem so random. So somehow, lack of knowledge, we as humans will sometimes ascribe to randomness. Uh, for example, 
Um, if some days of the week I forget what day it is. So like if I forget that today is Saturday, that doesn't mean that the fact that today is Saturday is random. That just means that I'm forgetful. But somehow like this idea of uncertainty, human uncertainty, still plays a role in our intuition in what randomness is. Um, I should make a point that randomness doesn't simply mean that something doesn't make sense though. Uh, for example, there, uh, at least in the sort of strict mathematical sense. Um, I can say a nonsense sentence, like uh, Noam Chomsky's fam uh, famous colorless green ideas sleep furiously. If I say a nonsense sentence, that doesn't necessarily make it random, although maybe the words that we put together in some sort of random order, uh, we don't mean that things aren't random in the sense of uh, that they simply don't make sense. When we talk about randomness in a uh, more, more mathematical context, we really do mean that there is some idea of what possible things it could be. And that brings us to our next uh, point, which is probability distributions. So, let's see, probability distributions. And there are a number of them that we'll talk about. Uh, let's start with coin flips. So, for example, if I have a coin here, and I have a tuning, oh, uh, you can't see that. <laughs> Yeah, so I have a tuny, uh, I flipped it, and it ended up heads. Um, if I could do this again, uh, it might end up tails. So coin flips seem to have roughly, uh, we like to think of it this way at least, an equal chance, chance of heads or tails. Heads or tails. Um, and uh, another example, which I already gave earlier, uh, if we have a, a die, well, this is a six-sided die, Die, it's a cube, and it seems to be an equal chance of one, two, three, four, five, or six. So you might argue that's not actually the exact chances for a physical die, but that's an approximation that we use. Um, or if you happen to have an icosahedral, uh, sorry, if you have a dodecahedral dice, so a 20 sided die, um, then that might have equal chances of going from one to 20. And um, this is an example of a very common distribution that we'll see, which is the uniform distribution where you have equal chances of everything. But of course, as any of you who played with dice know, you don't only care about a single die, you might care about uh, more complicated distributions, such as you get when you have a pair of dice. So if you have a pair of dice, then, uh, well, some numbers are a lot more common. You have a bunch of different possibilities, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12, but some numbers are a lot more common. So 2 might only be here, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and so these are the probabilities for each of these different numbers. Um, you can compute the, the, so when I ask you to uh, give me the probabilities, there are a couple different ways you can come around this. So if you've taken the street map at CMS, then you'll know how to compute this um, analytically by just looking at the different combinations of ones and twos, or threes and fours, or fours and fives uh, in a pair of dots. So you can uh, count those all together, and using some combinatorics, you can figure out these probabilities. Uh, it turns out that the chance of 7 is about 1 6, for example, and the chance of 2 is about 1 over 36. But I, I want to, there are a couple ways you could do this. So if you're a mathematician, what you do is you compute this uh, by um, uh, counting together the different combinations. So if the first die is a 4 and the second one is a 6, that's one way of making a 10, for example. But there's another way of doing this, and this goes back to uh, ideas of statistical sampling. So, Another way of doing this is I can just take this pair of dice and roll them one million times. If I roll this pair of dice one million times, then I would also get a very similar distribution uh, to what I have here. It wouldn't be exact because there's some amount of randomness involved, but somehow uh, what we're saying is that if I roll these pair, this pair of dice one million times, that tells me something about the chances of how it comes up on the millionth and one time. Because I can, get, I can understand um, if I do the million times, each time it tells me something about the distribution that these pair of dice do uh, have, and then the building the one time, even though it's somehow unrelated to the previous ones, we can still use that same distribution to then predict what's going to happen. And so the million and one time will be like, oh, well, about one sixth of the times it comes up seven in their last one million examples. And so maybe I'll pick, uh, say that one sixth of, there's a one sixth chance of it coming up as seven in the last, uh, in the one million and one example. And so this is an example of statistical sampling, and we can also use this to predict things where we can't easily combinatorially figure things out. So some things are easy to figure out mathematically, some things are less so. Uh, but for example, if I'm going back to talking about rainy days, well, how do I know if it's likely to be rainy tomorrow or not? One way is you can build a complicated mathematical model of the weather. 
And this is, of course, what uh, the um, Weather uh, and climate scientists have done. They've built really complicated mathematical models to predict what's going to happen the next day. And this is why you can have a weather forecast. You can be like, oh, well, that cloud's coming from uh, 40 miles uh, west, and so it's likely going to end up being rainy. But another way of doing it is you can just be like, well, how often does it rain in Toronto? It turns out that in, as, at least as of 2021, there were 115 days of rain, rain, which of course means that there were 250 days of not rain. Um, and so from that, you might say, oh, well, I don't know enough about complicated models of weather, because that's really quite complicated and requires all sorts of differential equations, but uh, which uh, you should study, because this is CMS and the B44s are really fun class. But if you don't know all these complicated models of weather, you might still be like, well, maybe the probability of rain on any given day is 115 over 365. And this won't be perfect, of course, but this is sort of assuming that when we look at the last year, at 2021, that gives us a forecast for the next year. Um, and so somehow, this goes back to the same idea that even though, uh, I, if I flip the, um, uh, if I roll the dice a million times, uh, that tells me something about the distribution that rolling dice comes from. And so if you make the assumption that the next day comes from the same kind of distribution that the last 365 days came from, then maybe you can do some kind of really coarse prediction of what the weather is going to be the next day. And so this uh, is an example of statistical sampling. Uh, statistical sampling. Of course, there are some statisticians in the audience, and I am way oversimplifying everything. But I'm just trying to get a flavor of uh, all these different ways that you can make use of probability. Um, uh, so to give a pretty easy example, if you, I have here a uh, mason jar full of subway tokens and pennies. Um, and if I don't know how many subway tokens and pennies are in here, well, one thing I can do is, well, I can just count every last one of them. But counting every last one takes a really long amount of time. And I may not want to do that because I'm lazy. So another way of figuring out is I can just sample randomly a few of these. Uh, let me... Uh, well, that wasn't a great sample, but uh, it, it was a sample, and sometimes when you randomly sample, the numbers don't exactly match up. It turns out that I picked out, uh, these are four pennies and one subway... Oh! Subway tokens, for those of you who are young and may not have used them, are what you used to use before Presto became a thing on TTC. But anyway, uh, so they're about the same size. They're close in size to pennies, which is why I chose them. I originally used two knees, but they were too big, and my sampling was always super bad. Uh, but anyways, I got four pennies and one subway token. So you might guess that, well, I'm going to guess that that means there are four times as many pennies as subway tokens in here. Which would actually be wrong. There are actually two times as many pennies as subway tokens in here. But, well... Sometimes when you randomly sample, if your sample size is too small, you get the wrong answer. Um, how big your sample size needs to be? Well, if you want to know that, you should take statistics uh, within our department. Um, but of course, the, uh, understanding the, these kinds of sampling is also super important just as an everyday citizen, because um, I was looking for a newspaper article about the new Toronto election uh, for mayor and about the polling, but I wasn't able to find one in the Globe and Mail, so I wasn't able to bring it in. But you all have surely seen uh, some examples of the local polls, and that's basically the same thing, where you could ask every one of the six million people in Toronto who, whether or not they like John Tory. But that would take a long amount of time. And so instead, you might assume, well, if somehow you can sample over all of the six million people, and maybe just ask a thousand people, you'd be able to have a, some vague sense of how many people uh, like uh, John Tory and are planning on, vote, on voting for him in the municipal, uh, municipal elections in the month. Um, yeah, and I, one of the things I want to emphasize is this is one of the powers of randomness. The sort of idea is, if you have a random distribution, that somehow covers your entire set. Uh, so if you have some way of sampling from your entire set, even if you don't actually talk to everyone in Toronto, if you have some way of sampling of everyone in Toronto, you can say stuff about the overall group of people without necessarily having to talk to everyone in person. And that's one of the really uh, big powers of using probability distributions. So even though, uh, so for example, if we were in the weather example and there were an evil wizard who was making it rain, but the fact that it rains today, I can't use to predict whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. Like, that, that's completely useless, because it's deterministic. But if it's random, and you have some idea that uh, the days are similar to previous ones, or at least drawn from the same distribution, then all of a sudden you can say stuff about the future because of the randomness. Um, any questions there? Yeah, what's up? Ah, 
Ah, so that gets back to what so that's what gets back to what it really means for something to be random. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I started talking about these distributions. Um, so you can't I can't predict whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. Um, but what I can say is that uh, there's about a 1 to 15 over 365 chance of it raining tomorrow. Um, if I I can't predict it exactly because yes, there is some randomness involved. Um, uh, does that sort of answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Um, Although, that actually brings up a really good point, which is, wait, can we actually use randomness to get something that isn't random? And that, that's going to be actually the point of the, uh, of the third example today, uh, when we talk about using randomness to prove actual mathematical theorems. So, of course, a mathematical theorem has to always be true. But how can you use randomness to prove something that must always be true? So somehow, there are techniques for like using randomness to do this sort of weird sampling over big spaces, and then, like, focusing it back down and then giving statements that are always true. Uh, and that's one of the powers of randomness, which is that you can explore these big spaces without actually having to explore the entire space. Okay, let me switch the page. Actually, let me take that back off. Okay, so I'm now going to give a couple examples, and these are of... Uh, the one I'm going to do is going to be one that asks for audience participation. So... Uh, let's do a randomized algorithm, and the way it's going to work is I have a deck of cards. Uh, actually, I need to put this back on. I have a deck of cards here. Uh, I have picked it out so that I only have the 20 cards that are 1 through 5 uh, in, the five or in the four suits. Uh, and I'm going to lay them all out. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, in different rows. 2, 3, 4. Um, I already shuffled these earlier. I will shuffle them again in case you don't believe me. And then I'm going to do a uh, task, which is I'm going to start with uh, pick randomly. Uh, so if you have a uh, pair of coins, you can flip them to pick randomly, but um, one of the four top cards, so that's a, oh, that's a, not visible, there. So the two of the two of the two or the five. I'm going to start on that card, so let's say I pick this card as my starting card. Select two as my starting card. I'm going to put the penny on it just to keep track of it. And then what I'm going to do is, if I, whatever number is on the card I picked, I'm going to move that many spaces to the right. So, one, two. I'm going to pick the five as my next card. And I'm going to keep on going, and when I get to the end of the right, I'm going to go to the next line, because I don't have no space to write this all in a big, long line. And so I'm going to go five steps. One, two, three, four, five. And that's a three, so I'm going to go three more steps. One, two, three. That's a one, or well, ace is one. So I'm going to go one step, and I'm going to go four steps. One, two, three, four. And then if I try to go four steps again, one, two, three, four, I end up, well, off the page, right? So this is the last card. So I'm going to select this four clubs as my very last card. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is, uh, does, did everyone roughly understand what we're doing? So, I'm going to randomly shuffle this pair of cards, uh, this uh, set of cards, uh, and I'll let one of the people in the front row cut it, just to let you know that I'm not cheating. So let's go ahead and shuffle this deck of cards. Uh, oh. Would you care to cut the deck of cards? Okay, so I could, uh, even if I could uh, do card tricks, which I can't, I actually cannot do card tricks, um, I'm now going to do the same thing. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. Oh, you can't see the top cards, can you? Oh, oh you can't? Okay, great. Three, four. Now I have these 20 cards out. I'm going to ask uh, everyone to start from the top row, pick your favorite of the four numbers on the top, and then follow this procedure. So now this is uh, random because there are several, two sources of randomness here. There's the randomness of which of the four cards you want to pick, and there's the randomness of shuffling the cards. Um, and then I'm going to ask a question after everyone's done. So I'll give everyone a moment to do this. How many of you picked the three as your final card? 
Um, no, so more than 50% of people did. Oh. At least 50%. Yes, at least 50%, but significantly more than 50 55%. Um, so I, I haven't actually tested it for this, but some very large fraction of the time, everyone is tasked to pick the right uh, last card, um, uh, picks the, last, the same last card. If you pick three at the front, then you get five. If you pick... Oh, no, if you, uh, yeah, if you get to five. Yep. If you pick ace, you get to five. I picked five, and then I got to three. So at least 70%. Yeah, but if you pick the three, that like goes one, two, three, and then the four, uh, four, four, one, two, one, two, three, four. Oh, and you still get to the three. So you get to the three no matter where you started. And so somehow, even though, um, so, uh, even though we all started in different places, most of us got to the same last place. And I think if we go went back and carefully did it uh, again, everyone should get to the last same place. In fact, you can show it. You can just start at each of the first start four starting places. You always end up there. So what this is an example of is this is an example of oblivious synchronization, which is a fairly advanced concept in randomized algorithms in computer science. But what it is, is even though we're starting with some random things, and we're starting at all different places, then so you could have started at that 3, that 3, that ace, or that 5, you end up in the same final place. Um, and this is useful if you're trying to synchronize two different uh, computer systems um, with, uh, while communicating some small amount of information. Uh, so, and this is one of the sort of cool things about randomization. Even though we started with things that were random, at the end we were all in the same place. And I, I can't tell you in advance, well, where you end up. So I didn't know before one shuffling this that you'd end up at the very last card. Uh, sometimes you end up at the second to last card or the third to last card. But even so, I was able to make use of randomness, harness it, and then turn it into something that's closer to deterministic. It's still not quite deterministic, but at least uh, we are able to get something out of it. Uh, and there are other types of randomness that can be harnessed for these kinds of algorithms as well. So I'm going to give uh, one of my, my favorite uh, algorithms that's actually used in practice by big tech companies. Um, how many of you here have heard of Alta Vista? Okay, so uh, a couple people here and there. So Alta Vista was an old search engine. So in the days before Google took over the world, there were a bunch of different search engines, Alta Vista, Ask Jeeves, etc., etc. Um, Alta Vista was one of these, and they had a problem, which is they had the problem that a lot of web pages on the internet are actually copies of the same page, or very similar. How do you find very similar things uh, really quickly? Well, you can compare them, but the comparing an entire web page to another web page is kind of slow. Well, maybe not today's computers, but back in the 90s, it was kind of slow. If you wanted to do this, these sorts of comparisons for the entire internet. And so, uh, Andre Brother came up with a really clever way of using randomness to figure out how similar two different websites are. Uh, so this is the mid-hash algorithm, which is still in use today. Like, this is actually used. Uh, and what it does is it tells you how similar two sets are. And the way it works is you start off by um, uh, choosing a random order. So you need some amount of randomness. So well, the way I'm going to do this is I have a, another deck of cards here. I'm going to randomly shuffle it. And that's going to allow me to choose some random ordering on all the cards. Ah, that's not our virtual shuffle. Yeah. So there's going to be some ordering on the deck of cards. Then what I'm going to do is then I, let's say I have a couple sets. So let's say I pick out uh, these five things, uh, these six things, and uh, Oh, I need a different deck here, or they're not going to be overlapped because there isn't overlap between a deck and itself. Uh, and let's say I pick out these um, couple cards here. Okay? So now, one way of comparing these two deck, uh, sets of cards is, well, you just look at each of the cards and you see, oh, well, is there any overlap? Well, you'll notice that there's the ace of spades in both of these, and that's it. So that's the only overlap there is between these two sets, and so they're pretty dissimilar. Um, if they were more similar, there'd be more, more overlap, right? But now, the problem is, if these sets were a lot bigger, so let's say each of these uh, sets of cards were uh, 100,000 or a million cards, then comparing them would take a really long amount of time because you'd have to look through each of the cards, you'd have to, one person have to tell the other person, here are all my million sets of cards. And that's a bit slow. Or if you're thinking about document comparison, you have to send the entire document over to the other party. Another way of doing this, though, is, remember, I have this ordering on all my cards. So this is an ordering on the entire set of cards. And what I can do is I can use this ordering to randomly pick uh, a card, and then I ask both sets, do you have this card? And so if I look at the seven of spades, do you have both cards? No, neither of those has both cards. Six of clubs, no. Nope. And the parts, uh, queen, uh, nine, uh, five of spades. Uh, wait, no, that's not. Uh, eight, oh, ace of spades. So in this case, the ace of spades uh, is in both of these sets. Uh, and if I keep on going, I might pick out the uh, ace of parts, which is only in last set. 
uh, and I might pick out, say, two of spades, which is only in lab set. And as I do the sampling, you'll see that what happens is, um, over time, the number of things that are in one set versus the other versus in both of them will approximate the number of things that are in one set or the other or in both of them. And so by using this technique, you can actually very quickly determine roughly how similar two different sets are. Um, the actual implementation of this makes use of things called random hash functions, which if you're a CS major, you'll know, and if you're not, then you may not be as familiar with it. But what you can do is by using this kind of ordering, you can very quickly determine that two sets are similar, uh, up to a point. Uh, any questions there? Okay, so well, that's enough of card tricks for now. Let me put away all my cards. Uh, and let's do some math. So uh, I, uh, I did promise you that there would be one proof in this uh, talk, and so let's go ahead and do that one proof. Uh, so now we've covered how uh, randomness is super useful for um, statistics, we've covered how it's super useful for computer science, but how is it useful for proving theorems, for proving things that should be true all the time? Well, uh, this is going to be an example of the probabilistic method. And it's a method for proving theorems. And note, it's not a method for proving theorems that are true some of the time, because that's not a very good theorem, right? Well, I mean, you can sort of, there are theorems you can prove that are true some of the time, and you can quantify exactly how true they are. But no, this is a method for proving theorems that are true all the time. And I'm going to give an example problem. Um, so let's say that I draw 10 dots on a sheet of paper. And you can do that if you have a sheet of paper. Uh, if you don't, well, you can come grab paper afterward and try this. I'm going to draw 10 dots. Let me put them in red. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay? So I've now drawn 10 dots. And now the question is, if I have 10 pennies, so these are American pennies because Canada doesn't use pennies anymore. Uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So now I have 10 pennies here, right? My question is, can I cover these 10 dots with 10 pennies without any two pennies overlapping? Um, note that I, don't, I can cover two pennies with one dot. So I am allowed to cover two pennies with one dot. The only condition is they can't, the pennies can't overlap. So I can do lat, 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 lat and lat. And I can put this penny anywhere I want. It doesn't have to cover a dot. So in this particular case, I can cover my 10 pennies with I'm oh, sorry, 10 dots with 10 pennies. Um, now, as a mathematician, the first thing I should wonder is, well, can I always cover 10 dots with 10 pennies? Does anyone have any sense of whether or not I can always cover 10 dots with 10 pennies? Yeah? You can always do it. You can always do it. Why? Because you just put one penny over each dot, and if there's a space where you can't put two pennies over the same dot, then you only need one penny to cover both of those dots. So then you don't have okay, so let me give an example with slightly more. Let's say 20 pennies and 20 dots. Or let's say 100 pennies and 100 dots. Uh, do you feel, still think the answer is still the same for lab? No, not for arbitrary, because the paper could be too small. Uh, let's say the paper is infinitely wide. Okay. So on the Turing machine paper, then... Yes. <laughs> on an infinitely wide paper, can you, uh, if you have, have 100,000 dots, uh, can I cover the wall with 100,000 pennies? Absolutely yes. Let me prove you wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, uh... So, they're really, if I put them all very close to each other, uh, so imagine these dots aren't actually overlapping. Well, so, I'm going to start by covering some of my dots, right? And I'm going to cover some more of my dots. But what do I do about those dots in the middle? I'm not allowed to do less, because that's uh, overlapping. I can try putting them closer, but even if they're closer, there's space between them, because they're circles, and so you can't pack circles exactly to entirely cover uh, a sheet of paper. And so if your dots are too close and they have enough dots, then no, you cannot cover them with any number of pennies. But then it goes back, so why do I pick the number 10? So if I have 10 dots, you might think, well, maybe if I have 10 dots, they can't be too close to like make it so that I can't cover them all, right? But how do you prove that? And so uh, one thing that a mathematician might do is they might be like, oh, well, I'm just going to draw a bunch of dots and try it a bunch of times and see if it's correct. And if it's correct, then I might try to prove it. And so if I were to do draw out a bunch of dots, I might do it another time. It turns out that whenever I draw out 10 dots, I can cover it. So um, if you experiment with this, you, you can't always cover 10 dots with 10 pennies. But proving it is hard because you know that there is this weird case, right? 
where maybe if you have too many dots, but it, how many dots is too many? This is a hard problem. It's uh, exactly how many dots you can get to before you can't cover with pennies is last I checked an open research problem. But for 10 pennies, we can actually prove it. And we're going, but in order to prove it, we are going to have to make use of randomness. So uh, let me give another way of uh, covering it. So let's say I have 10 dots on a sheet of paper. Um, and uh, where is my over my transparency? There it is. Wait, can I guess how this position works? <laughs> sure, go for it. I am guessing you are going to prove that the probability is not zero. Yes, that is exactly correct. So. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a particular way of dropping a bunch of pennies onto my dots. And the way I'm going to do is I'm going to drop an entire lattice onto my dots. So you'll notice that this is, uh, if I put pennies in, uh, I can do put pennies in each of these spots. I just drew that out as a lattice so I can move the entire thing at once. And then, um, with some chance, if I drop an entire lattice of pennies on, it's going to cover all the dots. If it covers all the dots, well of course I don't need more than 10 pennies. Because I don't need to put a penny in every one of the lattice points, only the ones that cover a dot. Sometimes, in fact, most of the time, there will be a dot like the one right there that is not covered. And if that happens, well, then I try again. I take my sheet of pennies, I drop it again. I do this over and over again. And what, you can see, what will eventually happen is some fraction of the time, it will cover all of it. And what all we need to do is we need to prove that some fraction of the time, this lattice will cover all the, pen, all the dots. Uh, and that will prove the theorem. Um, and the reason I chose 10 is because that makes this theorem easy. 10 is not actually, uh, people have actually proven you can do more than 10 dots, but for this particular proof, uh, 10 dots is the maximum that you can easily do. So let's go ahead and write out the proof, and I think I will use a pen because using Sharpie is not so great for uh, proofs. Um, yeah. Let me, yeah. So the proof is fairly simple, so uh, proof. Uh, can you all read that? Um, so proof. Uh, let me do that actually. That might be slightly more visible. Uh, use a lattice of pennies. We already did that. So that was um, my overhead transparency here, which, by the way, was really hard to find because apparently no one uses overheads anymore. Yeah. Um, so we use a lattice of pennies. You randomly drop it on the page. And we can formalize what it means to randomly drop a lattice onto a page. Uh, I'm not going to worry so much about that, but that is something you can mathematically formalize. Um, additionally, we can use geometry to determine the sizes of the holes. Uh, determine the holes are, uh, so for holes, I mean specifically the area that's not covered by a penny, so like this area uh, down here. Um, the sizes of the holes in terms of the overall area are the square root of 3 minus pi over 2 divided by square root of 3. This is a geometry exercise, so you can go back to your 11th grade geometry. You can figure it out. Yes, you do need to write out all the different like areas, etc. So you, you can figure this out. And this turns out to be about 0.0931, a fraction of the area. So this is the fraction of the area that is uh, not covered by pennies, if you drop a full lattice on there. Um, and now what we do is we let AI be the event that the i dot, so I'm going to call the i dot xi, so there's dots x1 through x10, I'm just going to give them names, uh, that the i dot uh, is not covered by any penny. And I'm going to let ai complement be the event that it is covered. Okay, and now this is a very simple probability exercise. Um, but uh, if you end up taking probability, I forget what the course number for probability is. Maybe someone in the audience knows what course number probability is. But if you take probability, um, this, is, this is all techniques that you'll learn in uh, probability class. The probability that all events are covered, all, sorry, all pennies, all dots, not pennies, all dots covered, you can write that as the probability of the intersection of all these events, i equal 1 to 10, of AIC. So this is the probability that all the event, all the dots are covered, which is equal to 1 minus the probability that uh, the union of the events 1 through 10 uh, AI. Uh, so this is 1 minus the probability at least one point uncovered. Because if one point's uncovered, then clearly uh, you can't have all the points be covered. Um, and uh, you can use a very simple bound uh, to show that this is 1 minus uh, greater than or equal to 1 minus 10 times 
0.0931, which is about 0.069, uh, which is nice because it is bigger than zero. And so you notice that, well, you have some, if I randomly drop, uh, where, are my, where are my dots? Uh, oh, my dots all just oh, there's there are my dots. So if I randomly drop this on the page, there's some small probability, about 0 0.069, about 0 0.07, that they are all, are all covered. So this proof doesn't tell you how to actually get a covering with 10 pennies, but it just tells you that there is um, a possibility that you'll randomly get it. And if there's a possibility that you'll randomly get a solution, then that means there clearly must be a solution, uh, because otherwise you, there wouldn't be any probability of getting it. And so that is how, you, this is the probabilistic method. It's actually widely used in combinatorics. So this is a very common method used in combinatorics, really popularized by Paul Erdős, though it was used by a number of other people, such as, if you're more into, say, information theory, one of uh, Claude Shannon's coding theorems uh, was originally proved using this kind of method as well. So what you do is you show, oh, I want to prove something always happens. Well, if I can show that, or something that is always possible, if I want to prove something is possible, if I can show that there's some possibility of it randomly happening, then clearly it's possible. Any questions about that? Uh, there are uh, serious theorems that you can prove with this as well, things like Ramsey numbers, stuff like that, but we're not going to go into that. Uh, if you take a combinatorics class, which I also don't know the number of, uh, that might be something that you cover in lab. Okay, and let me, I am uh, running a little on time, and I probably should have finished up a little bit more quickly, but we had pretty good interaction, so I'm not too worried. Um, so I'm going to finish off just by talking a little bit about how this is applicable to gen genomics, which is my area of actual research. So in genomics, uh, well, all of us have genomes, so you may have heard of that uh, in your high school biology classes or on the news, the Human Se uh, Genome Project sequenced the entire genomes. So what this means is basically, in our cells, we all have a big long string. And that string consists of things like A, C, G, P, G, A, T, P, A, C, A, A, C, G, etc. So there's this big long string of A, C, Gs, and Ts. And somehow, this is what codes for our genetic uh, heritage. This is what makes me me genetically and what makes you you. And what makes us different is the differences between them. So one of the whole points of, say, the Human Genome Project, genomic sequencing, is we want to read this entire string. Because if we can read it, then maybe we can analyze it. Unfortunately, this string is about, for lack of, uh, I'm going to approximate it as about 3 billion long. Um, that's not quite true, there are breaks in the string, etc. But let's just say it's about 3 billion long, and you reading an entire string that's 3 billion characters long is kind of hard. And it turns out we don't have the bio biological and chemical technology to read that entire string at once. But what we can do is we can randomly cut it into pieces. We cut it into pieces and we read each of those pieces individually. Uh, ACG, and maybe we had another piece here that's like ACG or something. Uh, and so you can cut these pieces randomly. Uh, you do this over and over again. So maybe you had another piece here that was A, C, 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 A. Uh, that, that's overlap. And then the question is, if you do this kind of random sampling, because this is a random sampling, what you're doing is you're randomly choosing a start point and you're reading some number, a random number of characters, can you piece together an entire human genome? Um, and as you might have guessed from the, this lecture, as well as the fact that I'm talking about it, the answer is yes. And this is, uh, there is still quite fruitful research happening in um, understanding how to piece together uh, a genome from uh, these sorts of random sampling events. Uh, and that is what I and my research students uh, work on uh, in terms of my research. And with that, I think I will go ahead and end it there. Um, thank you all so much for being a great audience. Yeah. And I hope everyone has a great first UTSC homecoming. Welcome back, everyone who hasn't been here for the last couple years.